In Luke 11 from verse 52, obviously here at the, at the end of this passage, but he said, Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. So they, uh, these scribes and Pharisees were, they really, he really touched a button with them uh, in this passage. And you have to keep in mind that it was the the priests, the Levites, the scribes, the Pharisees that had the responsibility of teaching the people, teaching the way of the Lord, teaching them the law. In other words, they were to serve the people. And yet, he said, you've taken away the key of knowledge. They were, they, they were, they were guilty of something in this thing. And that... Uh, uh, so rather than helping the people, he said, you've hindered them. You've kept, you've kept something from them. And not only that, you wouldn't enter in yourselves and you hindered them. And so this key of knowledge, I want to talk about that just a little bit, maybe about how it might apply to us and about just some things about knowledge in general. Because there is such a thing to the Word of God. A, a key of knowledge. And as I was saying in this particular case, look in Matthew 15, what it was that uh, that they did. In Matthew 15, from verse 1, it said, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. See, in this particular case, they took away the key of knowledge basically by telling the people that so long as you keep our tradition, everything's fine. And as they basically taught the people that God didn't mean what He said when He said what He said. That the, you can't take the God's Word at face value, which as they used the, out of the law, honor thy father and mother, and yet you teach people you don't really need to do that. And so you've made that the commandment of none effect by your tradition. And so and the same thing takes place in the churches today where people believe that as long as they keep their particular church's set of rules or ordinances or creeds, that that's equivalent to keeping the law and everything's fine. We, you know, there was no, there's no conviction anywhere about anything. They've taken, he said, you've taken away the key of knowledge. So in other words, there's got to be a, the, the, as I say, in this particular case, the key was taking God at His Word. Now, I want to as I say, I mentioned just a couple of general things about knowledge. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 8. If you want to go ahead and get another passage, you can. You can get Proverbs chapter 2. We'll go there in a minute. But you can get 1 Corinthians 8 and Proverbs chapter 2. Now, in 1 Corinthians 8, the Apostle Paul writing here, he said from verse 1, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, 
He says, now it's touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge. In other words, in the, the case he's referring to, that the idol is nothing. It just, you find that in the context. But Now it's touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. So, you know, charity, uh, excuse me, knowledge, knowledge in and of itself is, is uh, really not worth very much uh, if, it, if there's not uh, charity involved. Charity is, on, is much higher in the order of things here. And knowledge in and of itself puffs up. It, you know, we tend to get lifted up, puffed up by things that we know, and yet he makes it very clear there. You know, if any man thinketh he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. In fact, earlier in the letter, Paul says that basically the, what the wisest thing that we can do is become a fool, that we might be wise. No, it's come to the place where we realize that, that we really don't have any wisdom or knowledge apart from God and from the words of this book. Uh, look up, before we go to Proverbs, look at chapter 13 here in this same letter. 1 Corinthians 13. And he says from verse 1 here, I, I chuckle sometimes because, uh, you know, I'm tempted to make a crack about uh, people that think that God put 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in the Bible just so preachers would have something to read at weddings, <laughs> you know, and with the other translations that refer to the charity as love. But anyway, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing." So you see, not just knowledge in and of itself, just knowing things. In fact, I believe there are a lot of there's a lot of knowledge about the Bible without without the understanding of God and without the uh, the charity that it refers to here. So, in other words, it, knowledge has to be attended with charity for it to be profitable for for anyone. Uh, look at Proverbs two. And this is something that, of course, is just a recurring theme in the, in the book of Proverbs. It's all about these things. But in Proverbs 2, How we doing? All right. In Proverbs 2 from verse 1, he said, My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding." Uh, so not only do, does knowledge have to be accompanied with charity, it must be accompanied with wisdom. as we. We have to have wisdom to know how to use the knowledge or else it's not profitable for anything. Um, and you find 
and I believe that, the, that this is the order of things, and you'll find it throughout the book of Proverbs, that wisdom and understanding and knowledge. In fact, there's one of the Proverbs that refers to wisdom building her house. And it's like, you know, think about the God the Father from before the foundation of the world, by His wisdom laid out the plan, you know. And that God the Son took that plan and executed it, if you please, by His understanding. And, of course, the knowledge is like, like going back to the thing about a house, it's like the, the blueprint for the house has to be done by the wisdom. And then the carpenters come in with the understanding of the blueprints and they begin to frame the house and everything. And then knowledge is whereby they know not to put the commode in the kitchen. And, the, you know, that if things go in certain places it, it follows along in that pattern of things. But there's an, an, another idea in all of this. You know, you see there that he referred to seeking her as like silver and for treasure. Look, it's, it's close by there, chapter 3. In Proverbs 3, from verse 13, He said, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Uh, you know, the, I think we talked in the last class that came up in the, there's a, the passage in Luke chapter two, uh, 2 where the Lord at 12 years of age was in the temple talking with the doctors and, and, and of course that and Mary says, well, don't you know that we've been looking for you, that, that thy father and I have been seeking thee? And she refers to Joseph as his father and he, he corrects her. He said, how is it that you sought me? Wished you not that I must be about my father's business and I think about that a lot of times because you understand that what we're actually involved here or at least that we seek to do is to be involved in the merchandise of wisdom you know the, the trading and sharing uh, he said to buy the truth and sell it not there's a it's the merchandise of it is better than you know in other words what we're doing here is of more eternal value than trading in cryptocurrencies or whatever thing you might you know, flip in houses like we we're making the joke there about. Uh, you know, those things have to be attended to, but there is this, to, uh, he says that the merchandise of this is better than the merchandise of silver. Uh, this, the wisdom and knowledge. One other thing about this knowledge in general, go to Ephesians. And look at chapter 1. Now the Ephesian letter is written to people who have believed. He's not writing the letter to preach the gospel to them. They've already heard it and believed it. But he's saying that he's praying for them. And so in Ephesians 1 from verse 15... He said, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us were to believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ, when He raised Him from the dead, and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places. Now, I've mentioned this thing, you know, many times in Bible classes, that, but that... Bible knowledge or the knowledge of the things of God are not exactly like what we learn in school 
uh, you know, it's not exactly like other kinds of learning uh, because what we saw there in Proverbs that it's the first the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and it is God that gives the wisdom and the understanding and the knowledge. But that it's not something nearly that's learned as much as it's revealed. And we see things with spiritual eyes. In other words, they, uh, the, the knowledge that we receive from the things of God are, 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 are more like that. And I, I've mentioned before that if, if someone leaves from somewhere where I've shared, you taught, whatever, preached, if someone leaves from there and they might tell one of their uh, family members or a friend or whatever, he says, you know, I saw something tonight. I would feel that the Lord had blessed that Bible class if someone said that. In other words, more than if someone left and said, well, I learned something tonight. Even though, obviously, those things kind of go together somewhat. But, but I'm just trying to illustrate a point here that it's not exactly the same. Is that we receive the things of God through the eyes of our understanding, the, our spiritual eyes, and not really uh, wrote, you know, like memorizing a, like they do in catechism or, you know, uh, reciting some kind of a thing and, and saying this is what we believe and recite the Apostles' Creed or whatever. You know, it's like that. Uh, the Lord said that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So we can tell someone what we believe in our, in our heart. Now, what we believe in our heart, we can say with our mouth. Uh, and just throwing this in, I was uh, amazed years ago we went to see a dear lady. She's gone on to be with the Lord now. But she had suffered a stroke, and she was in the hospital in, uh, in Daphne. We, several of us went to see her, and, and she could barely put a sentence together. She couldn't converse with us, you know. And uh, Brother Moore, E.C. Moore, who I was with at that time there, he asked her, he said, well, Miss Paula, can you, can you quote John 3.16? And you know that she, she quoted the verse when she couldn't make a, a, a sentence of conversation, of ordinary conversation. She, and I, I'm just, I, see, I, I believe somehow or another that there must be some place in our, our heart or mind, whatever, where when well, David said the same thing, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against. Evidently, there's some place in, in us, in some part of our being, where those truths are stored. And it's just different from... You know, knowing your ABCs or uh, being able to name the planets or that kind of thing, you know. It's just different. Well, so there were, that knowledge comes through the eyes of our understanding. And we things that we see by the leadership of the Spirit. Um, go to 2 Timothy and go to chapter 3. And uh, by the way, this touches on something I'd intended to mention it earlier in the class, but in terms of, of the importance of, of knowledge, where say there's a key to it, and in knowing things, that, that where knowledge is, is very important, and that is, first of all, we need to know how to be saved. We need to know, understand what it is that God expects from us to be saved. What do, what do we need to know to be saved? And what, what do we need to know in terms of our walk, how to please Him? And then what do we need to know uh, to be spared from uh, loss? Uh, loss of reward, uh, that type of thing. Well, in 2 Timothy 3 here, uh, from verse 14... He said, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And of course, he's not saying to Timothy that, that the man of God is supposed to be perfect in terms of being a sinless, you know, sinless perfection, that kind of thing. The word perfect in the, in the verse is about having nothing lacking. In other words, that the, any man that God calls to go do a work, that he has what he needs in the all Scripture that's given by inspiration of God. He doesn't really need a college education. He doesn't need a seminary education or, or that kind of thing. And although in certain instances, maybe some education is a good thing. I don't mean to be criticizing having an education, you know. But some things that are called an education are nothing but false doctrine, really. But nevertheless, I said that that the Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, are able to make thee wise unto salvation. So there must be some key to understanding what it is in here that I need to know to be saved. Those if, if it's able to make thee what, me, me wise unto salvation, and all Scriptures given by inspiration of God. Well, look back in 2 Timothy, and look at chapter 2, verse 15 there. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. He says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now we've hit something, see. Uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. In fact, it says in the Proverbs, Every word of God is pure. In other words, it's all inspired from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to the Revelation 22, I believe it's verse 21. All of it inspired, and every word of God is pure, true, holy. And yet, he's tell, here he tells Timothy that it, to divide it. And he says to rightly divide it. I mean, there's so many things about this verse that are worth pondering. First of all, study. Now, this is not going to come to you just sitting in the chair, you know, uh, chanting or whatever. You know, you're going to have to study if you don't want to be ashamed someday. If you're going to do your work, which he says he's a workman, if you're not going to be ashamed, you're going to have to study, and you're going to have to rightly divide it. Well, see, that tells us, too, that it can be wrongly divided as well. It has to be rightly divided. And so there's there is a key. There's a, those. I believe that that's what that that uh, doctrine there, that truth, is what the key of knowledge is for us anyway. Is rightly dividing the word of truth, uh, and there is a method that's laid out in the scripture. If you look at Second Peter chapter one, take Second Peter one. And go back to 1 Corinthians one more time. Uh, chapter 2. What was that one? Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In 2 Peter 1, uh, Peter is talking about having been up uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. He and uh, James and John... They had witnessed the Lord transfigured before their very eyes. Uh, they heard a voice that came from uh, above. This is my beloved son. They he's talking about things that they heard with their ears. They saw with their own eyes. In fact, I, let's just read that. He said from verse 15, 2 Peter 1 verse 15. He said, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with Him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, 
Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Well, we already saw the passage in 2 Timothy said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And here he says that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. In other words, we're not, we, don't, we don't really have all that we need to know from a verse if we just have the verse all by itself. It's not of any... That's really the idea about, having, about a private interpretation. Even though, you know, you might say, well, it... it as we we're referring to, you know, denominational systems often have their own private interpretations of certain things. They have their pet doctrines and things like that. But see, the idea here is what we'll just look at this in just a second. Is since the 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 prophecy came it come by the will of man, so we don't we don't interpret it by man's knowledge, but the, that came it came by the Holy Ghost that. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So, in other words, we compare what the Spirit said with what the Spirit said. And then so that we're not, then we're not using a private interpretation. We're allowing the Lord to interpret His own book. We're allowing the Holy Spirit to interpret the words that came by the Holy Spirit. And, and notice in 1 Corinthians 2, that's just exactly what the Apostle is saying here. In 1 Corinthians 2, from verse 11, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11, he says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And, you know, I, I got to thinking about this somewhat looking over these verses uh, uh, earlier today that, that leading a Bible class or teaching, you know, preaching in its own way is somewhat like, is somewhat like being a tour guide. You know, it's like it, that we, we go, we're going through the book and we're looking over here and then we see what it says there and we see what it says over there. And it's not up for... The, the teacher or preacher to say, well, this is what I say this means. It's like that we compare the verses and, and as I say, hopefully we leave and we say, we saw something that we were, we were taught by God, that, the, we're, that we were allowed the Lord to teach us something. The Holy Ghost teaches as we compare spiritual things with spiritual. But you notice there that he says that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. So, while it would not be possible to really, truly understand the depth of what's being said there without the Spirit of God, at the same time, the, the Lord sends men who have the Spirit so that they can receive... The, any man, even the natural man that's mentioned in the passage, can receive the things of that man because he has to... We have each the spirit of man in us. <laughs> we, so we know the things of one another by our spirit which is in us. And this is amazing how the Lord arranged it this way. You know, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You know, uh, remarkable. The, the, and yet the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, but he can receive the things of another man. So that... A person can believe on Christ through the preaching of, of the Word, you see. Um, i tell you what, let me take just a second before we go any further. I want to mention that we're talking about rightly dividing the Word. And it's just amazing, and I, I, I don't necessarily say that I believe that the translators were inspired in the same sense that the 
men, the holy men of God that spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, that the Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I don't know if I could say that I believe necessarily that, but I do believe they were led by the same Holy Spirit in, the, in putting this book together because it, it's, it's almost like that there's a there's a dispensational pattern that's in there already. And I'll, we'll just go ahead and do it like this. We'll say that we have Genesis through Malachi that we call, you know, the Old Testament Scriptures. Uh, even though I do know a man that makes a point about Genesis not being Old Testament because the Testament doesn't come to the book of Exodus. And that's a, he's got a point, you know. But we call it the Old Testament Scripture. And so what we have basically, you know, I mean, there's a few things that are said about the creation and, uh, and those generations before Abraham but basically we get to chapter 12 and it's God calls Abraham makes promises unto him separates him from uh, his family starts over and he says that basically that the whole world is going to have to come to me through you so we have all of the promises that are made to Abraham and his seed and the uh, history of the of his people down through the the ages there until Christ comes and so, we'll, you know, we start over there with the, the New Testament Scriptures, as we call them. And the, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in there. And it's like that, as it, Paul referred to it in Romans 15, he said, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. In other words, all of those things that were promised back here to Abraham, to his seed, and uh, that he's confirming all of those things in here. And of course, the gospel that message is being preached is the gospel of the kingdom. Maybe we'll look at this in just a second. So that uh, that fact that, that the Gentiles don't really figure into that part of his ministry. I'll tell you what, go to, go to Matthew 10. Now in Matthew 10, let's read from verse 1. Matthew 10, verse 1. It says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And I might just mention there right quick that any time that God is dealing with his people Israel, the Jews require a sign. There, there, there are signs involved. Healing is in particular. In fact, from the very beginning, when Moses goes into Egypt, God sends him there. Moses basically says, Well, Lord, you know, I, I don't think they're going to believe you sent me. And he told him to put his hand in his bosom. He brought it out and it turned leprous. He said, Put it back again. And it was healed. First sign of healing. And he, then he tells him, of course, to cast his rod on the ground and it turned into a serpent. And he tells him, well, if they won't believe these two signs, then you to pour out of the water of the river and it'll turn into blood. See, he had to have the signs or those people are not going to believe that God sent him. And so it is from, for the people of Israel ever since then that any time that, that God is dealing with them as a nation, a, separate and apart, then the man that he sends has signs. And uh, so the twelve had to have the signs all the way through the book of Acts as long as Israel is not cast away. They're the signs and the wonders, speaking in tongues and all those things. So anyway, verse 2. He says, Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. Uh, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely receive, freely give. So there's the twelve being sent out. They have signs and wonders. They're told what to preach. Preach the gospel of the kingdom, which is repent and be baptized. The kingdom of heaven's at hand. 
They're told not to go in the way of the Gentiles. You know. And so, uh, so they sent out and they go. But of course, the, the, through the leadership of those same people we started out with, the scribes and the Pharisees who had taken away the key of knowledge, you know, uh, they led the people to deny Christ before Pilate. They called for his crucifixion. They led them to say, well, we have, don't have any king but Caesar. <coughs> and God raised him from the dead. And so we get over here to the book of Acts. And really, it's just a renewal of the same ministry that had gone on before. In fact, go to uh, chapter 3. Of Acts. Of Acts. Uh -huh. I'm <laughs> sorry. Acts chapter 3. <laughs> And in the chapter, Peter is exercising this power. He, uh, he healed the lame man, which was laid at the beautiful gate of the temple. And the people all come running around. And so anyway, verse 12, Acts 3, verse 12. It said, And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we'd made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murder to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, where we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted. And of course in chapter 2 he said, Be baptized. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. Now it's important that you see that the, the, the message here in Acts uh, in the book of Acts by the Twelve in particular that the forgiveness that's involved with their preaching does not look back to the cross. In fact, when they point to the cross, what they're doing is saying, basically, you're guilty. In other words, they're laying the guilt of the crucifixion on those people. It's like that, uh, as he said in, in chapter 2, he did, though why this man did all these miracles and wonders and signs, he did good and all these, and yet you turned your back on him. You desired a thief and a robber. You killed the prince of life. So you need to repent of that thing so that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. They're looking for salvation to come in the future, forgiveness to come in the future when the Lord returns. And of course all of this matches the doctrine in Matthew through John because he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved and to be like the birds and be like the lilies because you can't take the mark of the beast in the tribulation. This is tribulation doctrine. People don't realize it. I was taught it in a church, you know, Methodist church when I was a child. Nobody ever said, well, that's not for today. That's tribulation doctrine. You know, be like the birds and be like the lilies and everybody. I knew how to job. Well, they just not believe. Well, you know, they just were believing the wrong thing. That was not doctrine too. Go not in the way of the Gentiles. This, is, <laughs> this was doctrine for Israel at that day when there were certain things that were coming, they didn't know anything about. Uh, so look at ch uh, chapter 26. And of course, this ministry of repentance to the people of Israel is carried on along there, those first chapters in the book of Acts, until they stoned Stephen and... It's like that things changed. In fact, when, as they stoned Stephen, Stephen said he looked up and he saw, the, he saw the Lord standing on the right hand of power. He said, uh, 
uh, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man. And they, took, they stoned him. They laid their clothes down at a man's at the feet of a man named Saul, who was consenting unto his death. He was in agreement with him. They think like he's doing the right thing. So this same man Saul is giving his testimony in Acts 26. And he says from verse 12, he said, Whereupon as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, <laughs> and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So here we come, and, and, and there's a change come. See, the, uh, the Lord appears unto this, this uh, man who was a blasphemer and injurious and saves him by his grace. And this man Saul receives a revelation that no one had known before. And he calls it in the Bible, my gospel, three different times. He said, my gospel, not the gospel that was preached to go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, repent and be baptized. Paul is the first one to look back and to understand not just that Christ had died, but to know why He had died. Was, why? That, was that the testimony to the twelve that He was given? I, the was test. It, no, he he's testifying here to uh, King Agrippa. He's a, he's a, in, in Rome here. Oh, Not the twelve. There. Okay. He 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 met with the twelve in chapter fifteen. Well, I say met with the twelve. He, he refers to them that were of reputation. Peter, James, and John. Uh, of course, the James there is the half-brother of the Lord, not the apostle James, because he died and had his head cut off in Acts 12. That's why I believe that it was the apostle James, the brother of John, that wrote the book of James, which is why the book of James has no blood in it. He does, James, the man that wrote the book of James, never knew that Christ had died for men's sins. He knew that Christ had died and that He was coming back because He talks about looking for the return of the Lord. But you see, this is, this is something that was not known before. Uh, look in, uh, in, back, back in 1 Corinthians. Just go to chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians 2, Um, just because of our time right now, we'll look at verse 6. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. So he says, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. See, if those, if those, the priests and the Levites and uh, what have described the Pharisees that led the people to deny Christ before Pilate, which they were doing by the, you know, the, those men were doing by the leadership of the devil, that, it, that if it had been known all, anywhere back, if it had been known that Christ was going to pay for men's sins and that God was going to save people just by you believing on Him, then. They would not have crucified the Lord. Keep, keep it a secret. So it, it was kept a secret until it was revealed to Paul, which he calls my gospel. Three times he says, be ye followers of me. So you see, it's like that. Then we come after the book of Acts. We have this section of the Bible, Romans 2 Philemon, uh, uh, 13 epistles written by the man who says, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles. It's amazing. See where you've got... Right here, the emphasis is on 
12 apostles to 12 tribes, 12 is always associated with, with Israel. But in here, the dispensation that we live in, the time of Romans through Philemon, and we're not looking for the Lord to return. We're, we're already saved by believing that Christ died for us. That's, that's the wonderful thing about the, the... This is the section of the Bible where we find the gospel of Christ. This is that part of the Bible where we look back to the cross. These people looking forward, the twelve looking forward there in the book of Acts. And as I say, to go through the tribulation in here, Antichrist be revealed in the middle, and all of those things. And yet our hope is not to go through the tribulation. It's to be caught up out from this present evil world. At the, he talks about 1 Thessalonians 4, the shout, the rapture is... See, it's not for Israel. <laughs> Israel is saved at the second coming of Christ. And so the, the books of Hebrews through Revelation, again, we find not people looking back, you know, and having eternal security, but having to endure through the... And, you know, the book of Revelation, over, overcomers, they're going to have to overcome. But Christ overcame for us. And so this is, like as he says there, having to do with a mystery. And there's <laughs> Paul, who not only is the apostle, the, just like, you know, back here, back here God called Moses and gave him a special ministry. Here's Paul. He's given a special ministry. And there's a lot of things about those two that kind of are very interesting to notice. Look at chapter 15 while we're in 1 Corinthians. And this is, you know, as plain as it could be. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Not going to be saved, by which ye also are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. See, the, so much about just the, the key of knowledge of understanding things in the Scripture has to, you know, is involved with understanding that not every gospel is the same message. This gospel that we, that we were just reading there is referred to there in Paul's epistles as the gospel of Christ. This back here, gospel of the kingdom. Gospel of the kingdom looks forward to the second coming of Christ. Gospel of Christ looks back to the cross. Now, obviously the cross is important to this kingdom doctrine because it's the blood of the covenant, and the covenant's going to be confirmed when the Lord comes back to establish His kingdom, the millennial reign, you know, and all of that. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. It's going to be preached again. Again, and the emphasis again being on Israel. But it will be after the body of Christ. You see, it's what you, Paul's the first in the body of Christ. He's the first person to be saved by doing nothing. <laughs> it, but just trust to what someone else did. To trust that when Christ went to the cross, that he, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. So you see, that knowledge begins with understanding what is it I'm supposed to believe to be saved? I'm supposed to believe that Christ paid for my sins. I'm supposed to believe that He came into the world and that that death that He died on the cross was on my behalf because I'm the one that needed the nails in my hands and in my feet. I'm the criminal. I'm the murderer and the, all of those things in my heart. By the way, you know, they're, they're in each one of us, whether one works out and another works out another way. And the Lord, you know, made it very plain that just because you don't actually kill somebody doesn't mean you're not a murderer. Because if you've hated your brother without a cause, you're guilty of murder. So, well, I've never committed adultery. Yeah, but what about? <laughs> you all know that. No, see, so it, 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 there, that sin is the nature that's in every one of us, and God has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So, see, 
the, the, that's the, rightly dividing the word has to be that key of knowledge because it's that whereby we're able to understand the book. Look, look at 2 Timothy one more time and we'll probably start with this one. 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's like that there's a promise in here in this passage. 2 Timothy 2, verse 7. He said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So he said, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. It's like to say, see, that we have this, uh, as I was saying, that all of this word of God, all of this inspired book, is, he said it is for our admonition and our learning. This is for our admonition and our learning. But Romans through Philemon is that portion of the Scripture that is not just for us, it is to us. And so that's why we find things that are not the same. For example, you know, there's a... as I made the reference there to him teaching the those that followed him to be like the birds and like the lilies. They, they quit their jobs. They followed him. The man came to him, Matthew 19, you know, wanted to have eternal life. It turns out he finally tells him to sell that you have and give it away. You'll have treasure in heaven. He says he went away sorrowful. So he was going to cost him everything because to follow the Lord meant to sell out, which is exactly what they did in the book of Acts. They had all things common. But that's not what we're to do today. Paul, the Lord through Paul, wrote to us and said, If any man won't work, neither should he eat. Uh, he said that if a man won't take care of his own, especially they of his own household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. There's just all these things that are, that are not the same. He, uh, he told us that the parents ought to lay up for the children. It's right to work a job, put money in the bank, prepare for your children's education. That's right. But you couldn't do that and follow Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He said to them, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth to corrupt. In other words, it's for our learning there. And there's certain applications that can be made. But if you try to follow that, you're going to be in a world of hurt. And it's funny to me, you know, about, and it's, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes, but in Acts, the book of Acts and the churches that try to follow that doctrine in there, I mean, I, I see it all over the, the countryside. Acts, the church sign says, read and obey Acts 2.38, which is repent and be baptized. But why is it they don't keep reading down to verse 44, which says, all that believed had all things in common. Those that had houses sold them, land sold them, they had all things common. They don't do that. Well, if you're going to read and obey Acts 2.38, aren't you going to have to read and obey verse 44? See, they, they're just proving that they really don't believe that's to them. And it isn't. It was for that church at that time. So everything in this Bible is not the same. And that's, so it's, you have to, it has to be rightly divided. And uh, I've been trying to study this book for almost 30 years now. And that method's never failed. It, it was just, this is true now as it was then, you know. And you don't build big churches with that doctrine. You don't get, you know, that's not what it's about. But uh, it's that knowledge that's necessary for us to know how to be saved, how to live, where well, it's in Romans through Philemon. And it's amazing the warnings that are in there. Paul doesn't, I mean, he, he spends a lot of time warning the people about those that preach another Jesus. Talks about another gospel. Them that pervert the gospel. How do they pervert it? Well, they mingle it up. They say, believe that Christ died for your sins and get baptized because you're saved. That's, somebody invented that. That's not in the Bible. Now back here he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So it's part of their doctrine that if they don't get baptized, they're re rejecting the message. 
But Paul in 1 Corinthians there, he said, Christ sent me not to baptize. And so some people say, well, Christ I mean, Paul baptized some people. Yeah, he did. That's easy to prove. But he, he baptized them before Christ sent him not to. So that now there's only one. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. He talks about in Ephesians. And it's a spiritual one. Trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. Baptizes you into the death of Christ. You become a member of His body. It's a spiritual baptism. Can't see it, feel it. A man doesn't do it. Don't ask me to I mean, if you want to be baptized, ask everybody else because I don't, I don't believe it's a good work. But that's, and I've got my reasons for believing that, you know. I'm not, if, if a person has been, that's all right with me. I'm not, you know. But anyway, I, I'm, I, I better just find a stopping place. Well, Lord willing, maybe we'll talk, carry on with some of the, the thought here in their next Bible class. But I appreciate you being here tonight. That rightly dividing the word is the, that's where it begins with understanding the book. And trusting the Lord is where salvation begins.